Hello, welcome back. I am actually welcome me back. No, you don't have to do that. It's uh, really not necessary. Um, I've taken a little break um, because I was sick and then I just got out of the habit of making videos, but I'm back with my 20 year film festival. Um, some of you subscribers and viewers uh, may be new to this series, and if you are, allow me to explain what it's about. Um, basically, I've taken each of the last 20 years, starting with 1995 and working my way all the way up to uh, last year, 2014, and picking 14 movies, excuse me, I've picked 14 movies from each one of those years um, to recommend for someone who wants to take a look back at that particular year and some of the best cinema that um, that year had to offer. Um, 14 movies is basically... Uh, uh, if you were to watch one per night, that would be two weeks. That's about the length of a film festival. Although on most film festivals, you get to pick and choose what movies to see. You could see a lot. Several movies a day. You could pick one or two to see throughout the whole thing. Um, and uh, you can do the same with this, of course. Um, but if you want to watch one movie per night for two weeks from a particular year, then these are the ones that I would suggest. That's basically the whole idea of them. Uh, in the link uh, below, you will find... a. a excuse me, in the description below. It's been a while since I've done this. Um, in the description below, you'll find a link to the playlist uh, where you'll find all the previous videos. Um, I, uh, I've already done 1995 through 2002, and so now I'm on to 2003. So for those of you who aren't uh, champing at the bit uh, for Avengers, Age of Ultron, or um, if your uh, afterglow from the Star Wars teaser is worn off by now, Let's uh, look at movies that uh, came out quite a while ago. Uh, first of all, 2003 was a very big year for Mr. Johnny Depp, who starred in Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse of the Black Pearl. Um, one of the rules that I set up for this particular um, um, uh, series is that there not be any sequels or franchise pictures that aren't the first in the series and don't work as a standalone film. And Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse of the Black Pearl, works as a standalone film, I feel, although that rule is one that I'll be breaking very soon. Um, the exception to that particular rule is if a movie appeared in my top five of the year. If it appeared in my top five, it's automatically going on the list no matter if it's a sequel or not. Um, the other exception to the rule is if the movie is The Avengers, because it's just so darn entertaining I have to include it. That's 2012, we won't get, back, get to that for a little bit. But Pirates of the Caribbean, of course, um, was uh, a film directed by Gore Verbinski, uh, released by Disney. It was inspired by the um, amusement park ride, uh, Strange. I did go on Pirates of the Caribbean, actually, when I visited Disney World in 1983, 20 years before this movie came out. Um, I was a little bit sick uh, at that time, like I was recently, although I was more nauseous than anything, and I had a little trouble with the meal afterwards. Seeing all those skeletons and decrepit... Um, individuals, uh, animatronic characters on the ride, maybe even more queasy. So I didn't can't say that I enjoyed the ride all that much. The movie, however, I enjoyed quite a lot. It's a really, really fun movie. Of course, Orlando Bloom and Kira Knightley are the co-stars, along with Jeffrey Rush as the villain. Speaking of Star Wars, y'all watch that um, uh, presentation that J.J. Abrams and Kathleen Kennedy and some of the actors made uh, before the teaser went out uh, last week. Um, yeah... And, and, and I, I gotta say, this Daisy Ridley character, the one who's playing one of the main characters in the movie, when she smiles, she looks exactly, I mean exactly, like Keira Knightley. Seriously. Even her haircut reminds me of uh, Keira Knightley and uh, Seeking a Friend for the End of the World. Um, the way her eyes crinkle um, and just the shape of her mouth when she smiles, she looks just like Keira Knightley, only with straight teeth. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, her act in anything at all, because I don't know a thing about her, anything that she's done thus far. She has acted in a couple of things, but apparently she was cast in Star Wars only one year into her acting career. Oh, enough about Star Wars, sorry, Pirates of the Caribbean. Hans Zimmer. Hans Zimmer did the score of this movie, uh, as with the other films. Uh, a terrific score. Very lively. Uh, a, a really great score from him. I've been a fan of Hans Zimmer, actually, uh, for a long time. Ever since he did the score for Rain Man, which won Best Picture. Um, anyway, you all know a lot about that movie, so let's move on. <clears throat> Joel and Ethan Cohen, um, prior to No Country for Old Men, was on kind of a losing streak, apparently. A lot of people weren't crazy about the movies that he made between 
O Brother, Where Art Thou, and No Country for Old Men. One of those films came out in 2003. It's called Intolerable Cruelty, and was actually a script that they wrote but never intended to direct, but the people that bought it said, Hey, Joel Ethan Cohen, we got the script of yours. We're going to make it. You guys want to direct it since you wrote it? They're like, eh, sure, why not? Um, not one of their most well-liked uh, movies in general, but I like it quite a bit. I think it's a lot of fun. Um, George Clooney plays a divorce lawyer. Um, who's uh, an expert in getting absolutely everything his client wants. Um, he's just like inf practically infallible. He meets his math and uh, he meets his match in Catherine Zeta Jones, who's a professional divorcee, finding rich husbands, rich men, excuse me, to marry and then divorce very shortly afterwards and getting a ton of money. Um, there's a lot of uh, good character actors in this movie. Jeffrey Rush is also in this film, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> he, he's not the villain in the movie, but he, uh, he, he is, uh, has a key supporting role. Cedric the Entertainer, um, and um, Billy Bob Thornton has a little cameo. He's always lots of fun. Really like Billy Bob Thornton a lot. So, one of the Coen Brothers' best movies? Maybe not, but, you know, I like it a lot more than some of their more well-liked uh, films, like The Big Lebowski and... Um, um, and, and Oh Brother, I mean, I just think it's a tighter script overall. Anyway, uh, here's another rather under-heralded movie, I feel. Um, for those of you who are uh, fond of legal thrillers, I'm sure you're aware of the work of John Grisham. Um, he had a number of big hits uh, in the 90s, like The Firm and The Client and The Time to Kill uh, and what have you. Um, but uh, for my money, the best adaptation, the best film made up from one of his books is Runaway Jury, uh, which was directed by Gary Fletter. Um, he hasn't had a particularly distinguished career, but he's worked steadily over the years. I think probably the first film I saw of his was the indie movie Things to Do in Denver When You're Dead. It had a nice ensemble cast, uh, Christopher Lloyd, Andy Garcia. Um, um, uh, Treat Williams as a psycho. Uh, anyway, Runaway Jury is, uh, you know, sort of a director for hire, but it's a, it's a solid, solid film. Good legal, legal thriller. The main characters are played by John Cusack and Rachel Weisz. He is on a jury that's hearing, um, a civil suit against a gun manufacturer, um, but um, they are conspiring to sway the jury in a particular direction, and they've offered, basically, their services in doing so to both the defense uh, and the uh, prosecution, and um, I, I, there's probably another word for prosecution in this case because it's a civil trial, not a criminal trial. Um, but um, yeah, the um, lawyers on each side are played by Dustin Hoffman and Gene Hackman, one of the last films Gene Hackman appeared in. Um, good, solid legal thriller. Nothing especially remarkable about it, but it's a, 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 a good, good, solid movie. You know, and definitely, um, for me anyway, um, the best of uh, John Grisham's adapted work. Let's move on to a movie that is very, very widely heralded by lots of people. Pixar's Finding Nemo, a terrific movie. Andrew Stanton, of course, is the director on this. It's about um, the fish played by, uh, the clownfish played by Albert Brooks. Um, he loses uh, his wife uh, and all of his children except for one, Nemo, um, early on in the beginning of the movie. And then, of course, Nemo gets lost, uh, abducted by a diver and then put in a fish tank in a dentist's office. And then um, uh, Albert Brooks enlists the help of Dory, voiced by Ellen DeGeneres, to travel all the way to where the dentist's office is, or at least try to intercept um, the uh, diver before um, his son is lost. His son Nemo is lost for good. Really, really fun movie. Terrific, uh, beautiful animation. If you didn't see this in a theater, you're really uh, missed out, unfortunately, on some really, really beautiful uh, animation there, um, and just a good, solid Pixar entry overall. Pixar's made lots and lots of good movies. I'm excited to see Inside Out this summer, by the way. <clears throat> Next, uh, Phone Booth. Um, Joel Schumacher's been kind of hit and miss for me. Joel Schumacher uh, made the aforementioned uh, John Grisham film, The Client, in the 90s. Um, he also made a couple of widely, uh, widely disparaged Batman movies during that time. Um, he's responsible for Flatliners. He's responsible for St. Elmo's Fire. Falling Down with Michael Douglas. Um, this, uh, he hasn't had a great deal of uh, prominent films come out lately. This is one of the last ones that really got uh, attention. The main character is played by um, Colin Farrell, uh, who also starred in Tigerland, which is a low-budget indie movie that Schumacher made uh, a couple years earlier. Um, he's a PR guy, basically sort of a, 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 a talent manager, kind of a real sleaze who's always spinning lies. Um, and um, he's carrying on an affair with Katie Holmes at the same time he's married to Rodham Mitchell, and he conducts a lot of his business at a payphone 
booth, apparently the last working payphone in, um, in Manhattan. Um, and uh, one day he gets on the phone, and uh, at the other end is uh, someone he hasn't met before, a sniper, played by Kiefer Sutherland, who claims he's got a rifle trained on him and will kill him unless he does what he's told. Um, this is one of those real-time movies where the amount of time the film uh, uh, lasts is the exact amount of time that occurs within the story itself. Um, as uh, more attention is drawn to him, there's a police uh, detective, played by Forrest Whitaker, who arrives on the scene and tries to negotiate him. And Kiefer Sutherland's rules are, you can't tell anyone that there's a sniper in a building nearby who's going to shoot you if you don't do what he says. You have to do what I say instead. Um, so uh, he's uh, in a tight situation. I uh, really like Colin Farrell a lot. He's, uh, this is a great showcase for him. He's, he's terrific as this guy. Um, and it's a good, it's a fun little movie. Fun little movie. Really like it. Uh, definitely uh, one of Schumacher's high points in my opinion. Uh, another um, uh, director who's had a very, uh, uh, quite a varied career is Alan Parker. He's done some Oscar-nominated movies. He's done some movies that haven't been so well received. One of which is a movie called The Life of David Gale. A lot of people actually really hate this movie. Um, and while I see their perspective, I'm not on board with that. I think it's very thought-provoking and interesting. And presents a kind of unique character. A character who, under a lot of different circumstances, you wouldn't sympathize with once you learn everything you need to know about him. Um, but at the same time, he's sort of a, a person on a crusade. Think of him as a liberal activist version of Kaiser Soze. Uh, and, of course, it's uh, Kevin Spacey I'm talking about. Kevin Spacey, who played um, Verbal uh, in The Usual Suspects, of course, is also uh, the uh, person telling the story uh, in this movie as well. In this case, he's a guy on death row. He's a university professor and an anti-death penalty activist in Texas who has been accused, uh, charged, and then convicted with the murder of one of his colleagues, played by Laura Linney, and now he's on death row. And in the days leading up to his execution, after all his appeals have been denied, he grants an interview with a journalist played by Kate Winslet uh, and talks about what happened from his perspective. And as is the case with a lot of movies like this, you can't totally depend on what he says being the absolute truth. But um, I find it a very compelling movie. And it has a really, really terrific musical cue that recurs throughout the movie that's been used in a ton of other movie trailers since then. Uh, Milk, the artist, uh, Munich all use the same cue. Uh, it's a very, very uh, uh, sort of really gets the blood pumping type of uh, 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 crescendo of music. Um, I'm a big fan of it. Uh, and a fan of the movie overall. Um, I, I guess I think its criticisms are justifiable, but I don't share them. I, I really like it, so there you go. Uh, here's another movie that I've had a few arguments about um, by a director who's sh uh, uh, stirred up his share of um, arguments uh, in the uh, public sphere at large. Um, Neil Labute, who is the um, guy who did In the Company of Men and Your Friends and Neighbors, um, uh, some rather contentious movies, and here's another rather contentious one by those who saw it. Of course, it wasn't uh, widely seen when it was released. It's called The Shape of Things. Um, the main character is played by Paul Rudd. It's actually based on a play. Um, pretty much just four characters uh, in the play and in the uh, film. And if I'm not mistaken, the actors who appeared in the play also played the same parts in the movie as well. Uh, Frederick Weller, Gretchen Maul, and Rachel uh, Weisz, again, uh, are the co-stars. Um, but Paul Rudd is uh, basically a guy who meets a woman played by Rachel Weisz in the art gallery he works in, uh, and uh, she they strike up a relationship, and she is kind of encouraging him to improve himself, to uh, eat better, to lose weight, to improve the way he dresses and what have you. And um, he's had uh, long-standing feelings for Gretchen Moll, who is actually in a relationship with Fred Weller. They're all friends. Um, and so, at that point, he becomes more attractive to her at the same time he's dating Rachel Weisz, and it gets kind of into a complicated situation right here. Um, uh, yeah, it's a really good film. Uh, really like it a lot. And uh, I think it probably works great as a play as well, seeing as how it's so enclosed in the interior. Um, but it's uh, one that I like quite a bit. And there's actually a scene at the end of the movie where there's a character who's making a big sort of presentation in front of an audience. And I don't know, of course, but I imagine that <laughs> that would be basically the audience that's actually watching the play if you were to see it perform live. Uh, I, I don't know that for sure, but that's how I imagine it would be. I'm guessing it is, though. Anyway, there's seven movies from 2003. My next video will be back with another seven, uh, and then we'll move on to the uh, next year. Uh, so I hope that you have enjoyed this, and I hope that I've given you some uh, interesting uh, ideas for films that you may want to take a look at in the future. I will see you again real soon. Thanks for watching.